Well, we have been journeying through um, Paul's letters to Timothy. And if you've missed any of those weeks, you may have missed our conversation about um, the questions that exist about the authorship or the dating or the, the recipient that have been built over the, the centuries. There's been questions about those things. But in the midst of people's questions about authenticity, we realize we can still learn something from Scripture. That just because you have questions doesn't mean faith needs to stop. But rather we can lean into those questions and enter into dialogue and see what God has to say to us in the midst of that. So today we are diving into this last chapter in Paul's second letter to Timothy. This letter is quite different than some of the other letters we see in the New Testament, because Paul wrote a lot, <clears throat> because it's a personal letter. And based on the details that we see in this letter, we believe it's uh, a letter right before his execution, which um, was commanded by Emperor Nero, um, that you can look up that guy. He was, if you watch Game of Thrones, he is the Joffrey of, like, Emperors, Like, he was not a nice guy. If you haven't watched Game of Thrones, you have no idea what I'm talking about, and that's okay. He was not a nice guy, so this is what that means. He was a mean dude. He was, um, and so he ordered Paul to be beheaded. But before that happened, this letter occurred, and Paul is writing some final thoughts to his companion, Timothy, and what I like about the end of this letter is we see a hint of Paul's humanity here. Um, if, we, if we call this letter Paul's, we see something about the realness of people and their growth in God, even in the midst of their sin. Jay's making symbols at me, and I don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> so, um, life can be hard sometimes, and Paul felt that way as he was wrapping up and realizing his life was coming to an end. Um, that this was the last of what he might be able to say to Timothy. And so we are going to be diving in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and seeing two different uh, chunks here where Paul... Um, reveals his humanity through some humble brags and some vengeful forgiveness, um, showing a paradox of what it means to be a believer and a work in progress. So as we open up our scriptures today, I hope that we also can relate to Paul's story and to see that some humanity in the people around us and our own work in progress. We're going to start with looking at verses 6 through 8 together today. Uh, the text will be on the screen behind me, or you can read in your uh, pew Bibles, or just listen if you would like. I'm already being poured out like a sacrifice to God, and the time of my death is near. I have fought the good fight, finished the race, and kept the faith. At last, the champion's wreath is awarded for righteousness, is waiting for me. The Lord who is the righteous judge is going to give it to me on that day. He's giving it not only to me, but also to all those who have set their heart on waiting for his appearance. <laughs> Our scripture for today starts out with Paul having what seems to be a little bit of a pat on the back. Like, I've done such a good job. Like, go me. I've done great and when you look at the Bible and the fact that he was included, his letters were included in so much, he did a lot of work for the church, which is only one part of his story because he also tried to kill Christians before he started working for Christ. His story is perplexing, um, in the, but this humble brag isn't just about him. He roots it back to, oh, I did, like, I've, I've struggled, I've wrestled, and I'm here at the end. But this struggling and wrestling um, and waiting for the prize is not just for me, it's for anybody who has joined me in this struggle and wrestle 
for Christ and for truth. But anyone who has set their heart on Christ will receive the same award. We see this warm, fuzzy moment of Paul reflecting and saying some good things, probably through rose-colored glasses. And then in the next section, we won't read it today, uh, verses 9 through 15, it has this mixture of, once again, humanity, but some um, contradictions to it, too. Paul's like, hey, Timothy, can you come visit me? Bring me my coat and my scrolls and this, that, and the other. But there's also this guy that was a jerk, and I hope God judges him harshly. Like, you fought the good fight, right, Paul? Like, but also, that guy was a butthead to me, so I don't want God to like him anymore. And then, so we have this humble brag. We have this moment of seeing his struggles with others that he interacts with. And then he goes on to this um, realism moment, this moment where he's acknowledging what's happening in his life. The end is near, um, and we see some hope again. Starting in verse 16. No one took my side at my first court hearing. Everyone deserted me. I hope that God doesn't hold it against them. But the Lord stood by me and gave me strength so that the entire message would be preached through me, and so all the nations could hear it. I was also rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil action and will save me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever, always. Amen. So Paul um, went from his humble brag moment in this moment of rather vengeance in the passage we didn't read. And then he shifts to a place of saying, I, I was abandoned, I was left alone here. Because of that, I'm about to be executed. But I ask God to not hold it against them. That though they left me astray, God don't hold it against them. And in that moment, part of me is wanting to know, like, okay, so Paul, do you mean don't hold it against them, including that guy that you just said that you want... God to judge harshly? Or are we seeing a moment of Paul's realness where he's going, oh yeah, I'm supposed to forgive the people who hurt me. Will you help me, God? Because like, that's not always easy. Especially when you're watching your impending doom come up like Paul was. Don't hold it against them. I like to picture that as seeing some of Paul's process there of thinking about Yes, this guy hurt me, but also ultimately, um, God is the one that's in charge of not me. I don't know about you, but that's a very humanizing moment because we have those times of prayer in the middle of church, and sometimes I, it's like submitting like a work ticket to God. Like, I have ideas for how you can solve my problems. Here you go. Here's my ideas. And there's Paul doing the same thing in this letter. Like, God, just just smite this guy because he hurt me. Like, here you go. But also, like, I recognize that you are just and good and loving. Like, this is just a suggestion, you know. This is just my idea here of what I think is just. But then he points at the end. Uh, this is the last words we hear from him before he gets some final, like, tell that person hello for me um, verses where he's saying, ultimately, to God be the glory. I have ideas of what I want to be done, but ultimately, make sure things are pointing back to God, pointing back to him, not to myself. I love looking into Paul's story because it, it's not a perfect one. Um, Paul has become a pillar in the church uh, and one of the early church fathers but his story was not perfect. As we talked about a little bit ago, uh, he was somebody who persecuted the church. At that time, he was still going by Saul, which Saul and Paul are like the difference between Mary and Maria, just different translations of the same name. And he was a Pharisee, and you read in other letters that he calls himself a Pharisee of all Pharisees. They loved God's word, but they loved the letters of the word, not the essence of it. They were good at following the, the letters, but
but miss the bigger picture of what God intended. And Paul was so faithful to those words that he forgot, like, oh, the people in front of me are God's children too, to the point where he was ready to kill Christians because they were hurting the law. And God, Jesus accosted him on the road to Damascus and was like, Paul, what are you doing? Why are you persecuting me and my people? Like, we're on the same side here, buddy. Um, and Paul got his mind reframed, and rather than breathing death threats to Christians, started being the one reaching out to people and converting people. Paul fit the image of a man who is deeply devoted to God, but who was desperately missing the point of what God wanted from him. When you look only at the, the letter without the essence, you miss what God's intent really was. In our scripture reading for today, we heard Jesus' parable about a Pharisee and a tax collector. How they were both praying. Um, and, you know, at the surface, when you first look at things, both, of the Pharise both the Pharisee and the tax collector have prayers that are rooted in psalms. If you look back at the psalms, there are a few psalms that their style of prayer mimics. Uh, this, the Pharisee pointing back to God saying, thank you for who I am, uh, is a style that we see in the Psalms. But then the Pharisee goes, because I'm not like that guy. Like, thank you, God, for who I am, because I'm not this dude here. And plays this comparison game, missing the point that our God loves there's not a shortage of his love. There's an abundance. The Pharisee in Jesus' parable seems to mimic to me the connection of Paul before he was an apostle and when he was still persecuting Christians. And I even see in the Pharisee and in Paul's early stories some of the baggage of the church over the centuries. That sometimes we were... Um, as a whole, uh, throughout time, so focused on being right that we forgot to love, and the church missed the point frequently. There is an a artist that goes by the name Naked Pastor. I realize that's, I didn't pick it for him. Uh, but he has this chart that he made as a critique of um, the church it says on the side, one side it says how righteous you feel, and the other side says how much you hate others. And notice how it's going directly up. The more righteous you feel, not, not how you are, the, the more like judgmental you become. The more you're like, wow, I'm really awesome, that person's terrible. This is a critique of the church that we see in culture today. That we, when we miss the point of what God's telling us, we become uh, people who play a comparison game and compete for God's love, thinking that it's going to run out instead of recognizing the abundance of it and that it's, there's enough for everybody. It doesn't have to be like a, God loves me because I am really good at prayer. I say fancy words during prayer. And that, like, I have all my epistemology right down, and I know, like, I, I can use all the fancy $5 words in prayer, and so God obviously loves me more. That person, I heard that person use a cuss word during prayer. God must love them less. Like, heaven forbid. When in reality, no, no prayer is about I want your heart. I want what's going on inside of you in that moment. I want reverence in prayer is about being your true self with God and not putting up a front with Him. And so if that meant they needed to use a cuss word in that moment, if that meant that they were exposing their true selves to God in that moment, maybe that was exactly what needed to happen. Comparison is the thief of joy. And when we seem to look at scripture to validate ourselves and look at other parts of scripture to unvalidate others, 
We're missing it. But it's just like Paul's story, there's more to our story. We see Paul's story is a work in progress. Even in that passage we read today, there's a part where he's like patting himself on the back. There's a part where he's like super angry about a person. And then we see him going, wait, 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 Jesus. Like that's the point. Like we want like ultimately God's glory, not what I want, God's glory. And in that same sense, <coughs> we are each a work in progress. The people next to you, feel free to look to the side. Or not, you can just stand there like statues, that's fine too. The people next to you are a work in progress. We're not done yet. And there's enough of God's love to go around that we don't need to play the comparison game to compete to see who gets God's love. It's okay if they're not where you are and where you, and you aren't where they are. We're all in this healing, redemptive process together. Paul points back to this idea that those who cling to Jesus, who are waiting on Jesus, will receive the prize. It's not those who are, you know, finally perfected how to be angry but not cuss. Or it's not those who have finally perfected, like, the art of sacrificing as much money as possible, you know, while still being able to eat. There's not, like, prerequisites here, but those who cling to the love of Jesus will receive the prize. It's a lot less complicated than I think sometimes we as a church make it. Our goal isn't a comparison to compete for God's love. It's about clinging to Christ, who is an abundance of God's love. Our value is not based on earthly things, but on Christ. So today, as we're preparing here, um, it's Mustard Seed Sunday. We've had a busy weekend. It's Mustard Seed Sunday. We had fish fry yesterday. After this, we have our fall harvest and eat some more good food. We're Baptists. When we gather together, we have to eat, right? And sometimes it's hard to give because we want an itinerary of what's going to happen as a result of giving. But we don't have to play the comparison game with the people that we're helping. We can just be present with them in the moment, faithful that God's going to take care of it. Mustard Seed is a, is a ministry that's there walking alongside people that are in the process. They're not there yet, and it might take them a while to get there. Um, but we're not trying to rush them to be where we're at in that moment. The point is to help them to break cycles that have been there for a while. So we're going to prepare for an offering. I just realized the other offering plates back here. Um, so if you have your uh, envelope ready to go for the mustard seed offering, you're welcome to toss that in or take it with you and mail that yourself. Uh, and we will say something a gesture to me that I don't know what it means. Were you going to grab something or? Here you go. Yeah, sure. As, J as, uh, as we... Jay has a plate. He'll receive the, the offerings when we get a chance. But um, as we think about this, we remember that God's got enough love to go around. And as we are a work in progress, we can still love each other in the midst of that. We don't have to play the comparison game. Um, we can celebrate the moments that we're doing well, but also recognize that we're still a work in progress. Much like Paul's letter has a little bit of both in there and give ourselves a little bit of grace and each other a little bit of grace as we work through this. Let's join together in prayer. God, we thank you so much for the gifts of your grace that, um, that I don't have to be perfect in this moment, uh, but that you love us 
fully and wholly as we are right now. Lord, we thank you for the gift of Jesus and the gift of your spirit that we don't have to stay where we are right now, but can be healed and redeemed as we go throughout our walk with you. Lord, we pray that we develop a craving and a hunger for your love and your spirit transforming us. That as we pursue you, you continue that work inside of us. That we are not the same as we once were, but are made more into the people you built us to be. And that we can remain faithful to you no matter what circumstances are thrown our way. In your name we pray. Amen. Ask you to stand and join hands. We close our service by saying bless, bless be the time.